Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul Channel. I do have a new topic for today. Before I begin, I just would like to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance before you, Hashem. So this is continuing with the Mesilas Yesharim, which is called the way of the upright of the path of the just, from the Ram Chav of Moshe Chaim Lutzato, and this is from the Art Scroll Yaf edition. This is what the Sefer or book looks like. If you've never seen it before. And again, this is part 36, Baruch Hashem, finishing up with chapter 9. No, last week's was a little bit long, and this one is going to be finishing up. As of Hashem, it won't be as long. But we were talking about, or I was talking about um, in chapter 9, the factors that detract from Zerizus, which is alacrity. We were talking about um, a couple of them. There was laziness, and uh, I believe it was like fear, um, and uh, laziness in action. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna um, go through that again. If you want to hear what I said last time, you could listen to the the video from last week. So we just jump right into it now. Um, so this one is about fear. Uh, we're talking about justified and unjustified fear. So uh, the Ramchal says you should know that there is one kind of fear, and there is another kind of fear. There is appropriate fear, and there is foolish fear. Similarly, there is trust, and there is foolhardiness. For behold, the Master, blessed is he, made man a being with accurate intelligence and straightforward reasoning, so that he may conduct himself in a good way and protect himself from the harmful things that were created to punish the wicked. So the commentary here says, This world was created in order to provide man a place in which to serve Hashem, so that he may attain closeness with him and earn the right to bask in the shri, glory of the Shekhinah in Om Haba, as, as we've learned in chapter 1. So for that alone, it would not have been necessary for him, meaning Hashem, to include harmful creatures and phenomena in the world. Hashem created such things for the constructive purpose of punishing evildoers, so that they would realize that they must rectify their ways. Um, and then it says from there, see Shmuel Bet uh, 714, Derech Hashem part 246. At the same time, to ensure that innocent people not be harmed, Hashem provided man the intelligence to avoid those things. Thus it behooves a rational person to protect himself from harm, using his intelligence, his intellect, sorry, his intellect for this purpose is a fulfillment of Hashem's master plan. So what he's saying is about us being, um, you know, protecting ourselves, you know, we, we should have enough of that knowledge, you know, what, what he's saying is he created those things in the world is because that's to uh, punish the, the people who are, uh, you know, evildoers so that they can wake up. Basically, that's their, that's what's supposed to help them wake up, you hope. Is what I'd say. I add. So now he can, Ramchal continues. Now, if someone decides not to conduct himself in the path of wisdom and instead abandons himself to dangers, that is not trust in Hashem but folly. Uh, moreover, he is sinning by going against the will of the Creator, blessed be his name, who wishes that a person protect himself from harm. It thus emerges that aside from the innate danger of the harmful thing to which he is now susceptible, because of his passive lack of precaution, he's also guilty of actively forfeiting his life. So he's saying that not only is he putting himself in harm's way by doing this, but he's also forfeiting his life. He's guilty of that. So through the sin that he transgresses by putting himself in, a, in mortal danger, such that the sin of not being cautious itself leads him to be punished. So that, that in and of itself he's saying is a sin. So the commentary here says... In this world, he stands to be punished by being left to the whim of the mortal danger that he flouted, which may re result in his death. Moreover, in the next world, he will be held accountable for bringing harm upon himself. Um, that's from Rashi Nida 17a. So meaning that he's causing his own demise by doing that, so that he's going to be punished for as well. So Ramchal continues on. Now this type of precaution, i.e. protecting oneself reasonably from genuine danger, and this type of concern for one's safety, which is based on the guidance of wisdom and intellect, is the appropriate precaution and concern. For about this it is stated in Mishle 22.3, a clever person sees peril and hides, but fools go on and are punished. Meaning, you know, a smart person is going to know to, you know, to avert the danger, whereas a foolish person who just, you know, like, doesn't care, is like, I'll do what I want, and, you know, that then he'll be punished for, for doing that. So, but on the other hand, Ramchal says, the foolish type of concern is that a person should want to add precautions upon precautions and fear upon fear and to make a safeguard upon a safeguard in a way that leads to neglect of the Torah and divine service. So meaning this, he's saying the foolish person is like he keeps making one on top of the other on top of the other, like, you know, precautions on top of precautions, 
But the, these precautions are not like necessary, meaning he does that and then, then he neglects the Torah. So Ramchal now explains how to distinguish between concern that is appropriate and anxiety that is inappropriate. So now he's going to distinguish between those. So the rule with which to discern between these two types of fear, meaning he's saying justified and unjustified, is the distinction that the sages of blessed memory made when they said in Pesachim 8b, a place where harm is likely to occur is different from a place where it is not. The sages thus teach that in a place where danger is common and known to exist, one must take precautions. But in a place where no danger is known to exist, one should not be afraid. C commentary here says, the Gemara therefore concludes that even if someone is involved in a mitzvah where he would ordinarily be guaranteed protection from harm, and it says, see above note 17, which we, we just, um, I just read, I think. Was it there, note 17? Yeah. Um, no, that was from last time. About shluchai mitzvah, meaning a person that's uh, doing a mitzvah. If, if its performance entails a known or expected danger, you must take necessary precautions to avoid harm. If, however, there is no reason to fear harm, then precautions are superfluous. And as Ramchal stated above, taking needless precautions inhibits the performance of a mitzvah with zerizos and often prevents from being from altogether. So he's saying that there are times when you need to take the precautions because um, you know there's a known danger, but when there isn't, and if you take these unnecessary precautions, it's going to stop you from doing the mitzvah with alacrity, meaning quickly. So, and that's also the aid to hers. Mo, I'm adding that. I think we've said that before. Like that's how it gets in the way. Okay. So continuing on, regarding similar cases, it was said. Um, it says see Hulan 56b Rashi, uh, 48b. We do not assume a disqualifying circumstance that we do not see. And then it says see Baba Basra, uh, uh, Baba Basra 131a. So the sage who resolves halachic queries relies only on what his eyes see. So meaning, if you don't see it, you know, it's not there. Basically, I'm saying that. But now the commentary says, both of these passages do not deal directly with the issue of safety precautions, but rather with questions of halacha. The former clause concerns disqualifying factors that render an animal treifa, which means non-kosher on account of having suffered a mort mortal defect while alive. So the Gemara rules that if no evidence of such a defect exists, we need not fear that it might have been overlooked. Rather, the animal is deemed to be kosher. The latter clause concerns a rabbinic judge. He need not be paralyzed by the fear that there might be some factor of which he is unaware. Rather, he should proceed with the information at his disposal and rule accordingly. Ramchal extends this principle to the issue of safety precautions as well. In doing so, he provides a clear guideline for how to apply bitachon, trust in Hashem, to the performance of mitzvot. One should be aware of, one should beware, excuse me, of visible and predictable dangers, but not worry about hazards that are unknown and not to be expected. That's a matmas chalkot. Meaning he's saying what you can see is what you have to be aware of, that you already know about it. But if you can't, if it's not, if it's not known to you, then that's, don't, don't build up on top of build up. That's the unjustified, you know, like worry about that. Okay, so the Ramchal continues on. He says, this itself is the idea expressed in the verse that we cited above. A clever person sees peril and hides. Note that the verse speaks only about hiding from a peril that one actually sees. That's why I say the clever person sees. Um, I'm, I'm adding that. And it's not about hiding from something that merely might have a possibility of coming into being. Meaning, I'm saying this now, like, say, oh, and maybe this will happen, and maybe that will happen, and what if this, and what if that. But it, it's not something you see that's happening, so it's, you're adding things on top of things, you know. Okay. Um, um, so it's not about hiding from something that might have a possibility. So that kind of ill-advised hiding from perils that need not be expected is exactly the idea expressed in the verse that I mentioned above, meaning the Ramchal, Mishlei 26, 13. A lazy person says, there is a young lion on the path, a lion am among the streets. One who hides from such dangers will be inhibited by his worries from performing any mitzvah. So meaning, you know, uh, you're going you're gonna to say all these things might be, or they happen, and then they're not, or, or, or sorry, they might happen, and then it stops you from doing mitzvahs because you keep worrying about things that really don't exist. The Ramchal now continues. He cites a midrash to, a midrash to illustrate his point, this point. Our sages of blessed memory explain the concept in the form of a story. The, co the commentary here says the translation of Kimin Chomer, as in the form of a story, follows the Tosfos Kedushin 22b Rashi there. That's what, because in Hebrew it says Kimin Chomer. That's what, what's, what's in Hebrew. That's why they made this uh, explanation. So he continues on to demonstrate how far irrational fear can reach. To prevent a person from performing a good deed. Uh, they said in Devarim Rabbah 8.6, Shlomo Amel said seven things about the lazy person. 
The commentary here says initially 2616, after listing arguments that a lazy person uses to justify his inaction, Shlomo describes his, him as someone who is wiser in his own eyes than seven guides who attempt to provide him counsel. The Midrash uses an anecdote to illustrate how a lazy individual responds to seven successive pieces of advice that he receives regarding Torah study. And then says, see Mahar Zu to Devarim Rabbah. Okay, so he continues on these seven things. What, how so? So how so, you know, about the lazy person? Number one, they tell the lazy one, your teacher is in such and such city. And go and learn Torah from him. And he answers them, I am afraid of the lion on the road to that city. Then number two, they say, your teacher is in this province. And he say, and the commentary says, meaning he is in this city, so you need not travel beyond its limits. Again, from Maharzu. Um... So he's saying that he's right here, meaning, okay, so what does he answer? And he replies, I am afraid to walk in that neighborhood, lest there be lines among the streets. Number three, they tell him, your teacher is living near your home. And he replies, there might be a line right outside the door. What's number four? They say to him, your teacher is in your own house. And he replies, if I go to him, I will find the door locked and I will have to come back here, etc. See there. Um, so the midrash continues. Number five, they say to him, the door is open. Having nothing else to say, he concedes. Whether it is open or locked, I want to sleep a little more. Okay, number six. When he finally awakens, they place food before him, but he is too lazy to put it in his mouth. <laughs> the commentary here says, All these arguments are alluded to in the verses uh, 13 to 15. A lazy person says, this is what Shalom Hamel says, There is a young lion on the path, a lion among the streets. The door turns on its hinges and a lazy person on his bed. The lazy one buries his hand in the dish. He is too weary to return it to his mouth. Maharzu. So again, it's it's that's what he's kind of showing this this uh, story he brings it and it's from those Pshukim. So the last illustration portrays an individual who is finally present at a Torah lecture but does not bother to pay attention to what is being taught. That's from ATO six to Midrash. Um, so number seven is he uh, what he's just saying. Finally, since he fails to study Torah in his youth, he will not be able to know to um, he'll not be able to when he grows older, even if he wants at to at that time. The commentary here says, this is alluded to in the verse uh, 24 in that same uh, section. Because of the winter cold of the lazy person, I'm sorry, because of the winter cold, the lazy person will not plow. He will desire a crop at harvest time, but it will not be there. So there you go. So that, that means at that age, you already won't be able to. So you thus learn from this illustration of the lazy person's rationalizations. That it is not fear that causes him to be lazy. Rather, it is laziness that causes him to be afraid. So it's kind of returning it around. It's not the fear that causes him, but it's the laziness that causes him to be afraid. So the commentary here says, The lazy person is not lying. He's actually concerned about a line in the street or that the door in his teacher's room will be locked. While any reasonable person knows that these fears are ludicrous, the lazy one cannot see this. His indolent nature causes his subconscious to conjure up all sorts of imagined obstacles to the good deed, which loom large in his eyes because they support his idle inclination. That sees, and then it says, Sisei Chachamim Midos, volume 2, page 448, and see the inside on page 150. Um, I don't know if that's here or not, but there's also an additional commentary that says, The Midrash concludes that what Moshe said in the Torah goes beyond all seven things that Shlomo said about the lazy person. Poor person. Moshe states in Zavarim 30, 11 through 14, For this commandment that I command you today, then it also says in parentheses, the Torah, meaning Rashi to verse 14. It is not hidden from you and it is not distant. Rather, the matter is very near to you, in your mouth and in your heart to perform it. One does not even have to, quote, bring the food from the plate to his mouth, for it is already in your mouth and in your heart. No one can claim that he lacks a proper mentor to teach in Torah or that he lacks the intelligence to study it himself. All one needs to do is open his mouth to read and open his heart to explore. He will immediately discover the beauty of Torah wisdom that previously lay undiscovered within the recesses of his own mouth and heart. And then says, Volume 3, pages 309, 311. So he's saying that you don't even have to do anything. It's already there. The, the, the book is already there. Then you might say, <laughs> you could think, oh, you know, I, I really can't open it. I can't reach it. I mean, you could always find an excuse. A lazy person will always find an excuse. I'm just adding that myself. Okay, so he continues on. Ramahal notes, and one need not, not resort to scriptural or rabbinic teachings to derive the lessons taught above. Regarding all these matters that I have discussed in this chapter, meaning the Ramchal, namely that the greatest obstacle to disease is our indulgence in material comforts and excessive anxiety about the risks associated with performing good deeds. Daily experience attests to them. 
Their truth can be seen by observing the conduct that is widespread and common among the masses of people. Um, as this is their way brought on by their folly. That's from Tehillim 49.14. The commentary here says, The masses foolishly devote their lives to the pursuit of material comfort and constantly find reasons to postpone the performance of mitzvot. Any objective observer can see that this ultimately leaves them far from reaching their spiritual potential. And then says Tehillim chapter 49. So, you know, they're, they're so busy with their... You know, what do they say? Creature comforts that they, uh, yeah, mitzvahs always get postponed. This, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. You know, they always have a reason. So nothing gets done uh, as far as their spiritual potential. Okay, it continues on. One who studies the, the matter intelligently will find it to be the absolute truth. Wisdom will come easy to the perceptive one. That's from Mishle 14.6. Ramhal concludes his discussion of Zerizus. The topic of Zerizus has now been clarified with an elucidation that I think is sufficient to inspire the heart and mind. So yeah, this will be the end of, we're actually finishing up, that's why he's saying this, this chapter ends the reasons. Um, the wise one will utilize this to become wiser and further increase his acquisition of these concepts. Commentary here says, Ramchal, paraphrasing Mishle 1.5, indicates that in these chapters he has provided only the general principles that can stimulate a person to acquire the reasons, but he relies on the reader to use his own intelligence to build upon these principles and apply them in his own circumstances in order to attain perfection in this trait. That's Rav Yecheskel Sarna Yunim. And then it says, see similarly below chapter 26 and notes 39 to 41. Bezer Hashem will get there, uh, or I'll get there, and you'll be able to hear. Um, so he's saying that he's providing you the basic information that you need to know, and you need to expound on that yourself. Okay, um, so the Ramchal now closes the chapters on Zerizus with an observation on the relationship between the, this trait and Zahiros. Commentary here says, At the beginning of chapter 6, the Ramchal explained that Zahiros comes before Zerizus in accordance with the verse in Tehillim 34, 15. Turn away from evil and do good. So one should stop doing the evil before it can begin doing the good. Here the Ramchal adds insight into the reason for this order. So meaning, first you have to eliminate the evil and then do good. You can't say, okay, I'm going to do the good while you still have the evil because... It's going to counteract. That's how I look at it. Like, you can't have that there because it's, you're not going to make progress. And, of course, David Amel says until we can't refute what David Amel says either. So, okay, so he continues on here. Um, now you see that it is fitting for Zerizos to be the, the be the level that follows Zahiras. For generally, a person will not be a Zariz, meaning one who practices Zerizos, unless he is first a Zahir, meaning one who practices Zahiras. This is because someone who does not focus his attention on being careful with his actions, and on contemplating the importance of the divine service and its requirements, which is the definition of the trait of Zerizus, Zahira, sorry, as I have previously written in chapter 2. So again, I'll repeat that. This is because someone who does not focus his attention on being careful with his actions and on contemplating the importance of the divine service and its requirements, which is the definition of the trait of Zahiras. So that's what you know, that's what it means. Well, he will find it difficult to envelop himself in love and passion for the service of Hashem and to act eagerly with alacrity before his creator, which is the definition of the trait of Zerizus. Meaning if he's not able to be careful about what he does and contemplating the importance of it, um, which is what Zerizus is, then he's going to have, then it, it leads into him being, have a, a difficulty to have the passion for the service of Hashem and be willing to do it with alacrity, like quickly, with Zerizus. So meaning, so one follows the next. So you see how that, how that works. And he continues on, for he is still marred in his physical desires and is still racing along the course of his ruinous routine that distances, distances him from all this. And the commentary here, here says, as Ramchal noted in chapter 7, Zerizus is the natural outgrowth of internal enthusiasm for divine service. But such enthusiasm cannot develop without someone... With, I'm sorry, within someone who exists on a purely materialistic level. Zahiras, the ability to rise above oneself and supervise one's actions, is the first step away from immersion in physicality and thus the prerequisite for Zerizus. So now you understand why Zahiras has to come before Zerizus because one leads to the other. Okay, um, and he continues on. Um, however, once one has already opened his eyes to scrutinize his actions and to be careful with them and has already made an accounting of the gain and loss resulting from performance of the commandments, and conversely, from committing transgressions, as he mentioned in the description of Zahiras in chapter 3. 
It will be easy for him to turn away from evil and to yearn for that which is good, i.e. closeness with Hashem, and to act with Zerizus in acquiring it. This is obvious. So uh, here he says that Zerizus, carefully avoiding evil, is thus a prerequisite for Zerizus, which is zealously performing good and is complementary to it. These two traits are the basis of all service of Hashem, as they encompass all the mitzvahs of the Torah, both negative commandments that must be avoided and positive commandments that must be performed. Perfecting these traits is a footing for proceeding to the increasingly higher levels described in the ensuing chapters of this work. The degree of success one can hope for in acquiring those higher traits is dependent upon the degree of perfection one attains in Zahirus and Zerizus. That's from Atmaskalko. So again, he's saying that one leads to the other, and, and the Zerizus is, you know, move, you know, going away from the evil, and Zahirus is doing the good. So you see the difference. One is removing yourself from that, and one and the other. So meaning, he's saying that these are the basis for everything else going forward, um, and, and they, in order to get to the next level, because each level goes higher uh, on the other, so it's, your success is going to depend on how well you're able to perfect these traits. Okay, and now he, com- he, he has the summary of chapter 9, and Bezar Hashem, this is the end. So there are two main factors that prevent a person from acquiring the trait of Zerizus. One is the desire for physical comfort and relaxation um, and pleasure. The other is excessive anxiety and fear of dangers that might arise. To overcome the first obstacle, one must recognize that this world was made for toil and not for comfort. To overcome the second obstacle, one must cultivate cultivate within himself trust in Hashem. Fear and anxiety are proper when there is a clear and present danger. In that case, one is actually obligated to take protective measures. When the danger is not known and present, however, one must trust in Hashem and recognize that his fear may well be a product of laziness. Zerizus follows Zihiros because one generally will not become passionate about serving Hashem until he has taken the prior step of considering his actions and emerging from the morass of physicality. So that ends ch- chapter 9, Be'ezer Hashem. We'll be, start chapter 10 uh, for the next video. And I hope and pray that we'll all merit to live and see the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days and rebuilding of our final and everlasting Beit HaMegdash. Amen and thanks for watching.